be able to introduce you to our speaker for this afternoon, Professor Peter Humphrey. We are... <laughs> very fortunate indeed that he is here because he's traveled all the way from London just to be here with you today. And uh, I would like to thank also the anonymous donor who has helped make that possible, both this trip and the symposium and the exhibition to each musician. So. Professor Humphrey's participation possible. The Outen Visiting Artist Lecture Series was established in 1993 by Helen Wolf in memory of her sister Mary Jane Wolf Outen, class of 1927, to assist in promoting the Mayor Museum of Art and its efforts to obtain outstanding visiting artists and lecturers. Dr. Humphrey is Emeritus Professor of Art History at the University of St. Andrews, where he taught for 35 years. He is the author of numerous publications on Italian Renaissance art, including an introductory survey of painting in Renaissance Venice, as well as monographs on both Cima da Cornigliano and Titian, expertise he is sharing with us this weekend. He has served on the committees of several major international loan exhibitions held at the National Gallery of Art Washington, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles. He co-authored the catalog for the Age of Titian exhibition held at the National Gallery of Scotland and was guest curator of the exhibition of Heaven and Earth, 500 Years of Italian Paintings from the Glasgow Museums. That toured North America for uh, two years. For his service to Italian culture, Humphrey was knighted in 2005 as a member of the Order of the Star of Italy. Humphrey is considered the world's leading scholar on Cima da Cornigliano, and he is here today as two works by Cima are included in our exhibition, Venetian Visions. It has been a singular thrill for me to be able to teach Italian Renaissance art with original works of art on campus, and I have been amazed by my students' performance. Having original works of art to study rather than photos and books has made my students learn so much more, but also has engaged them in an entirely new way, with the result that they are more confident in their conclusions and more passionate about their ideas. In addition to having original works of art to study, my students are incredibly fortunate to have the author they have read so many times <coughs> this semester here in person to speak with them. It was a real epiphany when one of them realized that the Peter Humphrey of the symposium is the same Peter Humphrey the author featured so many times on our syllabus. I am so very pleased to be able to share the exhibition and symposium with the college, with the Lynchburg community, and I'm especially glad to see friends and scholars who have traveled a distance to hear Susanna Rutherglen and Peter Humphrey lecture. Thank you all for coming, and please help me welcome Peter Humphrey. Well, thank you very much indeed for this uh, uh, warm welcome. It's um, uh, a great delight and uh, an honor, in fact, to, uh, uh, to be here in uh, Lynchburg for the very first time for me. Uh, and on the occasion of um, the beautiful exhibition next door, small but very choice, and I'd like to uh, both thank and direct, or, but thank uh, Andrea Campbell and uh, Martha Johnson for inviting me and congratulate them uh, on, um, on such a lovely event. I, the the, high, the, um, uh, the hero of the exhibition, as you will have gathered, is the um, painter Pio um, and uh, the highlight of the exhibition is the, uh, the first slide to come up, 
virgin and child with a linnet, uh, this one. And in fact, you can even buy a fridge magnet, uh, which, is, <laughs> which they certainly don't have as a National Gallery in uh, London. Um, this is, uh, um, um, I think, not only one of uh, Chima's most beautiful uh, Madonnas, I think this is really one of the most beautiful of all uh, Venetian Renaissance uh, uh, Madonnas. Um, and um, I'm not just saying that because, um, you know, because I'm doing a lecture on it and, uh, and, and here I am, because it's been my favorite for at least 35 years. Um, which leads me to the cover of my book of, uh, that um, uh, Andrea so kindly mentioned of many, 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 many years ago. There was only one color image. There was no color image inside. And in fact, if you, if you ever come across a, um, a copy of this now very rare book, you will find it without this beautiful cover. <laughs> Uh, so uh, this is just to, this is one in pristine condition, uh, so you can see that this was my choice. Um, as you have seen next door, it's just across the wall, it's a smallish picture, about this size, uh, a couple of feet uh, high by uh, a foot and a half wide. Um, it's not dated, we don't know the exact date, uh, but uh, probably about uh, 1505. Um, and so I'd just like to um, look at it in some detail. What, what, uh, what are we uh, looking at here? Well, we've got the Virgin, Virgin Mary, who is seated on what looks like a marble block of some, uh, of some kind, um, of, uh, of cream marble. She's holding the Christ child, Standing a little bit, un whoops, no, no. a little bit uncertainly on uh, on her uh, on her knee, um, and he holds this little bird, the uh, uh, the, uh, the linnet that I put in uh, that I put in the title. It's not usually known as this, but it's it's quite convenient because it's the only one that does have uh, that does have that. I'm um, I'm not much of an ornithologist, but um, Yes, there's something uh, downloaded from the internet, and, uh, and you can see clearly that that is what it, that is what this little bird uh, is. <coughs> um, she no, the, she wears customary colours of uh, red and blue. This is, these are the these are the uh, the chosen colours for the Virgin Mary because it it um, expresses both her. Um, her, uh, uh, her character as a um, as a woman, human being of uh, flesh and blood. That's the uh, that's the red, but with a blue cloak, which suggests her celestial nature. Because as well as being a human being, she is the, uh, the mother of God. Uh, but she wears much more than this in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Chima's representation. She's wearing a white shawl, which is um, beautifully embroidered uh, uh, around the edges here. Um, probably some expert in the audience will, will tell me what uh, the, uh, you know, what technical name for this embroidery is, and in fact, what this sort of floral pattern is, um, uh, you know, where it um, you know, where it comes from. Underneath. Her, underneath her um, headdress, the, well, underneath her veil, she wears a headdress, a cap, so it looks like a cap, and the uh, and the diadem at the, uh, the centre. So that um, making it clear that this is um, you know, no ordinary, no ordinary woman. And then under her <coughs> robe. Just see glimpses of it. She's wearing a sort of coppery uh, tunic um, with the uh, neck neckline and the cuffs here um, uh, embroidered with what is actually a pseudo kufid uh, uh, script. It's it's a pseudo Arabic. I don't well, I don't read Arabic, but I I think that um, uh, if we had an Arabist an expert, uh, uh, head or tail couldn't be couldn't be made of uh, you know, of it. And I think the point is really that it is a, a luxurious fabric of a kind that was uh, imported 
have uh, imported from uh, the Middle East to uh, Venice in uh, large quantities. That and Venice has, of course, made it, um, uh, became so wealthy as a sort of hub of trade between the, uh, between the Near and Middle East and, uh, and the rest of Italy and, uh, and Northern Europe, Northern and Western Europe. And uh, these um, um, uh, uh, textiles were uh, brought from the uh, uh, from the Near East into uh, into uh, into Venice. And I think it's a sign just of a you know, of a luxury fabric that uh, no ordinary woman would uh, uh, be able to uh, to wear. And then in the background, and we've already had some reference to this this morning, this ravishingly beautiful uh, landscape. Um, on the left here, there's a soldier uh, walking along. Um, on the right hand, a, uh, a grazing deer. We've got um, uh, antique uh, buildings. Uh, here. There's a, um, a, a, ruined, a ruined temple. And on the right, a, uh, a bridge. And this is um, topographically Quite exact. This is a representation of uh, an ancient Roman bridge that uh, that still survives. The Bridge of Tiberius in Rimini, a, you know, a well-known um, um, uh, Roman survival, and uh, I I don't imagine that um, uh, Chima ever went down to Rimini. Despite the fact it's a, a popular popular tourist destination, because um, it because the knowledge of Knowledge of uh, of it was very well circulated through uh, probably through uh, uh, through drawings. Um, and um, going, back, going back to the painting, there are other late medieval buildings here, or or contemporary uh, two uh, two uh, uh, down here that you can see. A, um, uh, towers um, of, a, of a kind that you would uh, see in, uh, in, uh, in ordinary uh, sort of late, late medieval and, uh, and Renaissance Italian towers. But the widest, uh, the widest surroundings are not a bit like this. Uh, it's so the, uh, the Bridge of Tiberius is sort of uh, stranded here in the middle of a countryside that looks much, much more like the real countryside to the northwest of uh, Venice. Uh, the, um, uh, uh, Susanna showed us a map uh, uh, this morning with uh, not just Castelfranco but Corneliano on it, and they're both in the uh, foothills um, which lead up to the um, Alps beyond distant, you know, very high mountains. And uh, we also saw with Giovanni Bellini this morning uh, the Venetian genius for uh, suggesting particular times of day. And uh, Chima is doing this uh, here. It's of course not, not quite clear whether it's early morning or, uh, or late afternoon, but anyway, a rosy uh, glow on the, uh, on, uh, on, um, uh, um, on the horizon. Now, this is particularly evocative of the countryside around uh, Conegliano, and uh, here are a couple of views, again, downloaded from the, uh, the internet. This is, uh, this, is Conegliano, this, is, this is Conegliano itself, uh, a town of uh, Campanile and uh, Towers. It's on, the top of a, it's on the top of a hill, and um, this should really give a sort of view of the, the, of the landscape I'm talking about with the foothills and then uh, leading us to a really quite uh, you know, high mountain uh, beyond. Of course, a lot of uh, modern suburban sprawl in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in today's Conigliano. But nevertheless, what there remains, and you can see in the foreground here, vineyards. Yes, this is the home of Prosecco. <laughs> and again, I must pack my hosts very, very much for uncorking the, uncorking the Prosecco in my honor. <laughs> yes, this is where it comes from, uh, Conigliano. Um, and so this is Chima, always, always, always known really by um, 
um, with the name of, uh, of Conny Real. I'm sorry, I refused water earlier. Uh, 
the uh, Conegliano altar piece because it's painted for the main church and it is still there in the uh, in the main church in the uh, uh, in the town. Now I think you can see that this is really like um, like a large scale version of uh, his Madonna and Child because usually there uh, is at the center of this kind of composition uh, the Virgin and Child in that uh, uh, throne. So. Um, it depends how you want to look at it, but his half-legged Madonnas, like, like the Virgin and Child of the Linnet, the Linnet, can be seen as a sort of zoom-in in close-up of this group, or, um, um, or this group where the Virgin and Child is shown in full length, surrounded by uh, saints can be seen maybe as a sort of uh, greatly expanded version of the, uh, uh, of the more um, uh, convenient uh, Madonna and Child uh, image, conveniently uh, uh, domestic uh, size. Because of course this, this had to be large and grand, it was uh, placed above the, uh, uh, above the altar of uh, a church. Imagine the uh, altar table is going to be about uh, uh, here, then the, then the altar, and, uh, step. So this is really you know, way above the way above your head. This is a, this painting is going to be about this painting itself is going to be about as tall as this room. Um, and um, in fact, about ninety percent of his work was uh, was religious. Um, but occasionally, as we've already seen this morning, as we can see next door, he painted scenes from the. Old Testament, uh, such as the uh, David and Jonathan, and very occasionally too, there's just a small, uh, uh, a small handful of examples, um, he painted uh, mythologies. And this is a, this is um, a delicious little panel. It's a, only about, only about this big, tiny, and uh, but it's one of a pair, almost certainly designed to be uh, set into um, domestic furniture. We we don't know exactly. Because because uh, whatever it was uh, meant for doesn't survive. It could have been in a chest, but it's been suggested that it might have been for um, a, a musical instrument. Uh, so we don't we don't know. We've got the we've got the two um, these two um, uh, tondi um, um, circular mythologies uh, you know, by him. And he he did paint uh, he did paint a few others. Uh, but. Um, uh, uh, Really, they are the exception in his um, uh, in his output, which was um, uh, mainly, as I said, uh, almost exclusively uh, 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 religious. But now, this picture also shows his uh, genius for landscape painting. I think most Venetian painters um, uh, uh, painted uh, uh, painted landscape, but um, uh, Cima, along with um, Bellini, is one of the great uh, pioneers of this uh, this genre. And you can see how this is, this is uh, moonlight. Whoops, sorry, sorry. Okay. Um, the um, this is the uh, shepherd boy, rather, rather charming. He's not looking, looking after sheep at all. He's looking after <laughs> another uh, sort of miscellaneous sort of display <laughs> of uh, animals. Anyway, this is moonlight. He's asleep, and the goddess Diana, in the form of a moon, is. Sort of hovering over oh, him, of course, Diana falls in love with, uh, uh, with, this, uh, with this boy. And um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the light effects are really quite, uh, 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 quite magical. Uh, and, the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, and I've already mentioned just now the Venetian interest in different times of day suggesting well, night or uh, dawn or, or daylight or, or dusk. Well, uh, so uh, coming back to our, uh, to our Madonna, um, he uh, came to his maturity in the uh, 1480s and um, by this date, uh, Venetian painters were very well conversant with the great innovations that have taken place uh, throughout the preceding 80 years, both in the rest of Italy and in Northern Europe, in, uh, uh, in Flanders. 
So the heritage of um, you know, early 15th century uh, painters in Florence, like uh, you know them all, um, is his, um, his ability to evoke a uh, solid volume in a three-dimensional space. So these are completely convincing as a fully rounded figure, this sort of cylindrical form of the, uh, of the Christ child, the cylindrical form of the, you know, of the Madonna's neck. She's um, seated slightly obliquely into space, but of course uh, gives, gives us a strong sense of the, um, the projection of her uh, body um, in from the immediate foreground marked by this, uh, this parapet into the, uh, into the depth of the picture. There's not a huge stress on um, the geometric perspective, but it, it's, but it, is, it is there on her, on her throne. So uh, Chima is someone who is uh, not, not innovative at all in this. He's the heir to the, to the uh, discoveries of um, that of perspective. Um, you know, made by his, uh, his 15th century uh, 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 predecessors. And you can, you can also, the, the, the Madonna's hips are on a diagonal into the space and, uh, 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 and her shoulders. So it's, there, it's completely convincing as um, a pair of, um, of, uh, of two um, fully rounded um, uh, three-dimensional objects and uh, his, his command of, uh, of light helps that too. That the, you look at the passage like the, uh, his lip, or no, no, here, better still, how it's going from the highlight into um, uh, differing degrees of shadow into quite sort of dark shadow behind him. So uh, this is, I'm, I'm only, uh, I'm not saying good anything you know, innovative about this, he is the, uh, he is the heir to all these, uh, uh, these, uh, these 15th century uh, uh, conquests. And this spatial clarity applies also to the landscape. You can read very clearly how it works with the um, river here twisting into the background, paths, winding, winding up the hill. So you see winding up, uh, up the hill on both, on both sides, and you can, you can read exactly how that, um, you know, how that landscape uh, works. And then within this orderly geometry of the landscape, he fills it with, um, uh, with objects, the buildings I've already talked about. Again, you can see the sense of recession, one, one behind another, um, this, 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 this. To the distant background, and then the forms, these, uh, these animals, and, uh, and other objects that I've drawn attention to, which is quite small scale, uh, uh, small scale attention to the um, to the plant there, and beautiful, beautifully observed um, reflections on the water. So the um, uh, reflections of the bridge on the water, or of this uh, this tower uh, uh, here, and in this connection. I'd like to draw attention to the fact that uh, Chima is indebted not just to Italian predecessors, but also to, uh, to, uh, to Flemish painting. Uh, and um, this is, um, uh, uh, we talked, we heard a little bit this morning about the uh, different uh, techniques uh, used by Venetian painters of this uh, time. And a bit like Bellini, uh, Chima gradually um, transforms himself from a uh, painter mainly in tempera to, uh, um, uh, an, uh, uh, to a painter mainly in oils. And this is a relatively late, late work, so middle, middle late. And uh, this is uh, essentially an oil painting. And uh, the richness of color, the depth, the depth of color, the, uh, the depth, the depth depth and saturation of the colour in these, in these reds uh, and these blues, rather well preserved blues here, um, uh, depend, uh, are dependent on his uh, command of uh, you know, oil painting. This is achieved through building up 
uh, glazes in layers, you know, one on top of the and, and each other. You get great, uh, great, uh, great sort of depth of color, which glows like a like a jewel. Now these these um, uh, effects of you know, richness of color and uh, uh, and of light is indebted to a different tradition of. Um, uh, or painting, and that's uh, Northern Europe. And I think this slide is a little bit uh, washed out. Of course, I could have you know, many examples, but the uh, later 15th century uh, painter Memling, based on Bruges, was very well known in Italy, and um, uh, including, and perhaps especially, uh, in Venice. Um, I, have put the, I have put the date on this, and I think this may be because the date isn't known. Uh, but anyway, I don't want to. Um, you know, I don't want to say that she knew this particular uh, painting. I'm only showing it because uh, of uh, the attention to uh, small-scale detail that uh, that, uh, that Tsuchima is also attentive to, um, and also the um, the depth and the richness of the uh, uh, the colour. Um, uh, and. And, uh, and yet, uh, and yet the, no, the, just just um, um, uh, just to finish off on the discussion of the visuals of the uh, of the Madonna. Just I've been talking about the uh, the treatment of forms in space, but one should never forget that um, artists are also designing on uh, on the surface, and there's. A very, um, uh, a very um, uh, you know, impressive uh, triangular or pyramidal uh, you know, composition. It's a very, uh, it's a very sort of grand design. I, I mentioned just now the way that the uh, ledge here uh, forms a, uh, you know, a base for uh, this uh, very uh, you know, solid uh, 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 pyramid of the figures. And notice also the way the colours are repeated over the surfaces. So, you know, you, you, you know, when looking at it, you naturally read this as background blue sky with clouds, but it's also an area of blue and an area of white, and that picks up the blues and the whites in the foreground. So that the figures are also very um, uh, closely integrated, um, you know, with their, you know, with their, with their surroundings. Now, in practically all these effects of, uh, or characteristics of style uh, that I've been talking about, um, Chima is uh, deeply in, uh, indebted to uh, Giovanni Bellini, uh, the painter uh, we, uh, we heard uh, quite a lot about this morning. Um, Bellini was a whole generation older than, uh, than Chima, and it was he who um, created the uh, fully Renaissance uh, style in Venetian painting. And one can see that we compare some masterpieces by uh, Giovanni de Nunez on the left of uh, dated uh, 1488. And there, by the way, is a very handy reminder that these works were painted for altars. It is, happens to be above its original altar in the, uh, in the church of the Priory uh, in Venice. So there is the, the altar table and, it's, and this beautiful painting by Benini is in its original frame. Uh, it's, a, it's a triptych, actually. And I think this can be quite helpfully um, juxtaposed with the painting next door. By, and I put Bartolomeo Gambrini there. Um, I now think wrongly. I, I thought that the attribution to Antonio was wrong. The two brothers, Antonio and Bartolomeo, uh, but um, uh, it came from Gale, an attribution to um, but uh, to Antonio and um, uh, or second thoughts, I think it's right, so you could delete that in your mind's eye. Antonio, mm -hmm. yes. although I will show something by Bartolomeo in, uh, in a moment. So this is obviously the same subject, um, you know, virgin and child uh, on a throne, exactly the same as, uh, as that, with angel musicians, a couple of little angels up there, uh, and uh, angels at the bottom of the throne in the uh, case of the, uh, the Bellini. But the, um, the 
the meridian picture is quite badly damaged, as you can see when you go up close. All this kind of reddish area is not meant to be red at all. This, uh, this, this is the um, surface on which you painted the gold. But this is all meant to be all meant to be gold, um, not red. In fact, in this figure here, you see the paint's completely fallen off the figure. And but also, this is um, only. Uh, 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 oh yes, and uh, also this color. Uh, it's um, yeah, this is the sort of greeny, greeny blue. This is meant to be uh, strong, intense uh, uh, blue. And um, so, um, uh, 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 and no, it's also very important to bear in mind that this is only a fragment. And if you go up uh, close to the picture next door, you can actually see the beginnings of an of a arch profile which shows that it had not this um, a pseudo Renaissance spread that it has now, but it had a, a it had a pointed arches that came up like that and had a pointed arch at the top. So what's that one? the panel is um, the panel is uh, is cut. Um, get that um, the panel is uh, cut at the top, probably a, a bit at the bottom too, and maybe at the sides for all I know. To get an idea of, of the kind of uh, frame it was in, and by the way, it certainly wouldn't have been just on its own. Uh, the uh, the Bellini has got um, uh, two pairs of saints on either side. Um, this may have been it at the center of a much more ambitious uh, complex, something like uh, this. Uh, this, is by, this is by the two brothers, um, epileptic dating from uh, 1450, so perhaps, perhaps about sort of 10 years earlier. There you can, and there you can see the central virgin and child uh, has this. Uh, this is an original, original Gothic frame, magnificent um, uh, display of uh, rich carving uh, that was so important to uh, to artists. In, well, in, uh, I was about to say in the Gothic period, of course, this continues uh, through into the Renaissance as well. But this is a this is um, a wonderful. Example, now in the um, in the museum in, uh, uh, in Bologna. So I think we, we must imagine that the um, uh, well, if you if you uh, if you took this bit of framing off, you'd be left with a um, um, you know, rectangular panel uh, like that. But so it covers up the uh, the corners uh, there. So it's an arc with a pointed arch uh, like that and. Since we don't know where it came from, we don't know how many uh, saints at the side. You can see, you know, how many there could be. Uh, two on either side there, but then in half length in an upper uh, in an upper register. And then it goes on and on up with um, um, uh, with your pinnacles and uh, and, uh, and finials, all in very elaborate uh, carving and richly gilded. The, the, the effect of a painting uh, like this would have been uh, um, absolutely magnificent. And really, quite. Um, you can also imagine it in a in a church above the altar, lit, of course, by candlelight, and with the you know reflections of the gold. The uh, the uh, effect would have been uh, not just you know materially magnificent, but give a uh, a sense of uh, you know, holiness, uh, of um, uh, of mystery. Now, so, but moving on to. To uh, moving back to uh, to Bellini, um, uh, Bellini maintains a lot of his visual magnificence. He's also got a richly carved frame, uh, but by now, so this is 1488, and uh, this uh, this 1450, there are great change in style has taken place. His his frame has. Uh, now adopts the Renaissance vocabulary, the classical vocabulary of a, a rounded arch. These are um, these are classical pilasters in between. And also now he's creating the illusion that uh, this is just like a sort of uh, proscenium, and that the space uh, behind that is continuous uh, in a way that is not at all suggested here. These are just each each saint in his own uh, in his own compartment. So 
but Mini is, is getting the, the best of both worlds, and uh, another, uh, he's, getting, he's getting both the logic, uh, the realism of, uh, uh, of the Renaissance style, but also he's retaining the, um, uh, the richness and the uh, religious mystery uh, of, uh, of a work like this. And he's also achieving this by harking back to the uh, Byzantine uh, uh, tradition of, uh, of Venice. Um, you can read to uh, the Church of San Marco in Venice, you know, rich in mosaics. And so he's, he, he, he's, he's imitating here uh, Byzantine um, apse and, uh, and barrel vault uh, above the above the above the Virgin and Child. Well, so 1488, and uh, this is really about the time that uh, that Chima established himself uh, in, in Venice. Now, before this, um, Bellini had already created a different kind of altarpiece. That's to say, an altarpiece in which the saints were all completely in the, um, uh, in the same space. Um, in, uh, in this work, there is a, it is implied. Uh, but they are they are separated by these uh, sort of divisions of what remains after all a, uh, a triptych. But before then, um, Bellini had created, as Susanna showed this morning, the um, San Giove altarpiece. So this is this is already in um, uh, 1480, so eight years uh, eight years old, uh, earlier. The saints are all together in the same space. Uh, surrounding the throne of the uh, of the Madonna. So, still, this is the same subject as the, uh, uh, the uh, as the Yale picture, but the saints that we imagine were beside the Madonna here are now all together uh, with her in the uh, in the same uh, 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 in the same space, which takes the form of a barrel vaulted chapel. So there's a, a barrel vault above them. And this um, mosaic apse that recalls very much the, um, uh, the mosaics of San Marco. Also, in San Marco, you have these um, uh, uh, walls richly clad in uh, colored marbles. This would be, uh, um, uh, these would be extremely expensive uh, marbles, a bit like, actually, this goes back to my uh, theme of um, uh, uh, um, imported textiles uh, from the Middle East because the, uh, Venice benefited so much from all these um, rich and exotic uh, materials being uh, brought to it by, uh, by sea. Now this, this painting, the San Giove altarpiece, was a major source of inspiration for Chima and his, his altarpieces. And I've already shown an example. I've shown his uh, Conegliano uh, altarpiece. The uh, Bellini here is the direct source of I don't really have to labor this point. You've got uh, Virgin and Child on the throne, you've got the saints in the same space, and they're under a, a tall uh, um, you know, architecture. Uh, architecture taking the form of a tall rectangle, but arched, arched at, the, uh, at, the, uh, at the top. Um, um, there is perhaps a, uh, a little bit less uh, material richness in the uh, in the Chima than here. We haven't got such displays of marbles and mosaics, but nevertheless, they're there. And he's got this idea from the lead. They've got uh, uh, mosaics in the uh, in the spangles and in the uh, and in the dome suggested in the in the dome at the at, at the top. And uh, richness also in uh, different coloured marbles um, in the uh, in Madonna's. Uh, thrown here. All these are of uh, marbles of different uh, of different kinds, and indeed there is here a um, an exotic carpet. And you see the Virgin's throne has got. Um, sorry, I'm not an expert on Oriental carpets. Um, I don't know whether this comes from Turkey or from uh, further afield. But uh, anyway, um, a, a, a luxurious uh, import from the Middle East. Um, looking at this, although the, the slide is a little bit um, 
um, a little bit um, you know, washed out, but you can see that Chima is very, very skillful at, uh, at hard surfaces, at, paint, at suggesting, um, uh, suggesting marbles, uh, at suggesting uh, mosaics, and this saint's um, you know, breastplate is, again, it's encrusted with, uh, with jewels. Uh, he's got all of that. He's not, he's not quite so good, or perhaps he's not quite so interested in, in a human flesh. Um, it's, it tends to be rather sort of hard, rather like, you know, rather like um, uh, sort of like China figures, like, uh, you know, like, uh, like porcelain. Very characteristic of Chima, though, is the fact, and in contrast to Bellini, is that the back of his altarpiece is, instead of being an enclosed chapel like that, is open to the sky. So his scene is filled with daylight, and you have a sort of dappled effect on the uh, 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 on the figures, and uh, and also up uh, up here, look at the way the light is just slanting in on this um, um, copper barrel vaulted architecture uh, up there. Bellini is a great landscape painter. We've seen that this morning, but not so much in his altarpieces. He tended to be, he tended to exclude, he tended to um, make uh, landscape a very subordinate element in his altarpieces. And that is really quite a deliberate choice by Bellini to maintain something of the um, liturgical solemnity uh, that, is, uh, that is so impressive in a painting like this. She was just a little bit more, little bit more informal, uh, and uh, so he's enjoying, you know, letting, uh, letting the light in. Now, in, in the, and um, uh, uh, he's encouraged even more in this direction when he is called upon to paint uh, narrative scenes. Now, as it is, it's only a year, only a year later, and you have a wonderful um, panoramic uh, landscape. Now, of course, you're not going to show the baptism of Christ taking, uh, uh, taking place inside the chapel, taking place inside the interior. This is, uh, this is meant to be the River Jordan, and so he's taking the opportunity here of opening up the whole of the baptism, the way we've already seen in the Madonna. But this is a church altarpiece, a much more the formal kind of setting. Uh, the, uh, again, you've got the uh, river, river, the River Jordan, snaking back into the distant background and then you know, paths going up to this citadel. A little bit too fanciful, I think. Um, this is not quite Conigliano, it's a little bit improbable, uh, but, very, but very picturesque. There is a, um, there is a, you know, a distant city, now that looks a bit, a bit more like, um, like, like, like Conigliano. And again, uh, attention to details of uh, plants and uh, animals and there are ducks ducks swimming around in the river, uh, in the river Jordan, and of course the um, jagged peaks of the, uh, of the Alps, and maybe specifically the Dolomites uh, in, the, uh, in the distant background. So now here the landscape is obviously um, prompted by the subject, unlike in representations of the you know, virgin and child standing there with, uh, you know, with saints, where uh, it, uh, uh, you know, where no landscape is, uh, uh, is called for. But I think I'd like to emphasize it's, it's still quite symbolic. It's not really, it's not really a, um, a narrative scene straight out of the Gospels, where um, uh, the Gospels have described the baptism of Christ. You mentioned um, the, uh, the catechumens, so other, uh, uh, you know, other people uh, are coming along to have themselves uh, baptized by the uh, by the Baptist, uh, none of them there, and instead you've got three angels that aren't mentioned in the uh, uh, in the Bible, and you know angels are there to hold Christ's garments and to act as sort of um, as you know, deacons, like or um, or servers to the uh, uh, to uh, the Baptist, who's you know, in, you know, in a way like the you know, officiating. Uh, priest as he uh, as he uh, as he performs this um, sacramental act of uh, you know, a baptism. The baptism, of course, is a major sacrament of the uh, of the, of the church, um, enabling um, you know, mankind to be to be redeemed from sin. So, so Chima, in an altarpiece like that, it's not, it's not just showing that 
you know, a chance episode from one of the Gospels. He is, uh, he is he's emphasising its continuing um, you know, uh, sacramental uh, significance um, in, the, uh, uh, in, the Christian, uh, in the Christian church. But then, conversely, he sometimes, he, he had, so obviously, but he loves painting landscapes. And this vision of landscape could be extended to um, uh, non-narrative subjects, um, such as this one, that's a painting normally known as Madonna of the Orange Tree. So Madonna and Child now seated not in a chapel like this, uh, but in the open landscape, no architecture at all, um, with a uh, really a, a, an orange tree taking the place of this uh, baldacchino that we have in, yeah. the, in the Lili, and uh, a couple of saints uh, on either side. She's on a throne, a sort of throne, a sort of rock that happens to be throne shaped. Uh, so she's uh, found it and, uh, uh, and, sat, uh, and sat down on it. Um, and Jim, um, we, um, the topography of the Veneto very much, uh, you know, again, with the you know, blue mountains in the, in the background, uh, here adapted to this, uh, this, uh, this religious scene. Now, in this picture, um, we have another innovation, which is typical of Chima as opposed to, uh, as opposed to, uh, to Benin. Um, even, I think, even in this picture, as compared with this, there's a sort of slight effect of kind of swaying movement um, uh, between the figures, whereas the Lini's figures stand very solemn and still. It's part of this, um, it's part of this you know, solemnity I'm trying to talk about. But uh, although they aren't actually, they aren't actually moving, you have a sense that they're moving their heads a bit. But here, the the um, virgin and child are sort of split in different directions, <coughs> looking uh, one way and her the other. And the saints are, it's as if they just come in. They're sort of moving, and they're sort of moving in uh, towards them. So, of course, it's not, it's not you know, dramatic movement. They're not running in. But um, there is a, a greater effect of movement in, uh, uh, in Chima's autopieces than you, uh, than you find in, uh, you find in, uh, uh, in Bellini. And so a sense of action and interaction between the, uh, between the figures. Um, and he applied, uh, he, um, uh, 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 he applied this course to uh, actual narratives. He's already seen a little bit of that way. Of course, the baptism, the back, John the Baptist had to perform some action to do the baptizing. Um, but then here, the accrued here, this is a, 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 rather, a um, rather a strange uh, conception of the uh, theme when you think about it. This, of course, is the gospel, gospel episode of, the, um, of uh, Thomas um, uh, peeing Christ's uh, side after the resurrection. Uh, but it's just it's just Thomas and Christ. Where are all the other disciples? Instead, and, uh, this is certainly not another disciple. This is a um, this is a bishop say from uh, early, um, uh, from uh, St. Magnus. I think he's something like the sort of sixth century or something. He's one of the he's one of the early bishops in the uh, in the area of the. Uh, the Veneto, who is there as a sort of uh, a, a sort of witness. So it's a very peculiar sort of halfway house between you know, a narrative and one of those sort of purely symbolic representations uh, of the Donners and Saints that, um, uh, that we've been uh, that we've been looking at. But one could one could actually say the same of the uh, David and Jonathan. Um, uh, uh, we heard this morning that these are dear friends. If I can um, um, produce my own quotation here from the Bible, from the Old Testament, of course. Um, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. Um, so they're shown conversing, perhaps, you know, perhaps affectionately. But this, this isn't an actual biblical episode at all. Uh, this is a sort of encapsulation of their relationship. When uh, when David had uh, cut off the head of Goliath, there um, he didn't he didn't uh, he didn't sort of go home with his best friend. In fact, I think they hadn't even met at this at this point. Um, 
he went home in, uh, uh, he, 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 went, he went back to uh, Jerusalem in uh, the Argentine time. So this is a sort of, yes, a encapsulation of their, you know, of their, uh, their relationship. And of course, it's, it's, it gives the artist an excuse to show, to show them in, in, in a beautiful landscape, landscape surroundings. Um, and so, um, uh, combining um, uh, uh, the landscape there to uh, help uh, uh, give the, the celebration of the relationship between these two young men a sort of uh, timeless significance. Well, now I'm moving back to his uh, to his Madonnas because um, his the way he developed the half length uh, Virgin and Child following or, or the development. Development of the Virgin and Child in Venice in this period followed a very similar pattern to what I've just been describing in uh, altar paintings. Uh, now here is uh, a much earlier uh, Madonna by Antonio Viverini of the uh, of the 1440s, and here is one by his by his younger brother, uh, 1475. So this is still you know, earlier than um, uh, than, uh, than Chima. In the um, in the in this one. Um, Still has a still has a gold, uh, a gold background, although I'm not sure whether this this had a pointed arch on or, um, uh, at top or not. You don't you don't really know. Um, uh, uh, you know, or, you know maybe maybe a, you know, a small Madonna was a, uh, a completely a rectangle like uh, like this. Um, already in 1475, so this is uh, you know, before Chima even starts work. Um, painters are using this device, the foreground parapet. Uh, in fact, the, um, the, the cushion and Madonna's uh, cloak are sort of coming over it, and that helps establish a sort of spatial, um, a, a spatial relationship with the, um, you know, with the viewer. Um, but um, uh, Bartolomeo, whether you know, whether by uh, by design or by accident. Doesn't he is really not so um, not so um, interested in the clarity of spatial relations that I was talking about in the case of uh, Chima, and he's a very linear artist indeed, and you see these rather you know, tormented uh, lines of curling around on the surface, uh, which which um, uh, which rather flatter composition. Uh, and uh, make you tend to sort of read it like a, a bit like a sort of high relief rather than rather than sort of forms in the round, so, you know, like a, but like relief sculpture as opposed to you know, round statues, if you like. <coughs> um, but uh, of course, he's aware that this is the, the, this is the uh, this is the Virgin Mary, and uh, this is a very common device in. Uh, or, you know, or accessory in uh, Indonesian Madonnas, this so-called uh, cloth of honor, which is uh, behind the Madonna to show that to show that to show that her uh, uh, queenly status. Look how he's, um, how it looks like a bit of uh, luxurious uh, silk fabric that perhaps has just been taken out of the cupboard because it's still got its uh, its folds on it. Um, and uh, this has to become a standard accessory in the Madonnas of Belize. Uh, so uh, ten years later, um, Belize Madonna of the Pair, uh, Belize is one of the great painters of, uh, you know, of Madonnas. It's uh, uh, his, uh, his speciality before it was that of uh, uh, Chima. And uh, you've already got here a uh, uh, beautiful, a beautiful cloth of honor of watered silk. Also, looks like it's just been you know, unfolded uh, with the with the parapet, with uh, an object, probably a symbolic object, a, a pair um, uh, on the foreground image there, and a lovely bird of landscape. The landscapes of Bartolomeo tend to be a little bit like the you know, Montaigne, rather kind of uh, rocky and uh, uh, narrow, a little bit, in fact, a little bit like these. Um, Novels only, only hands as, uh, as well. Chima, in his Madonnas, tends to do away with this idea of a of a, of a, of a flat cloth of honor. 
as in our example, and also in, a, uh, in another example uh, on the left in, uh, in Los Angeles. And so this is sort of following the same tendency in his, in his altar pieces to um, make it you know, less indoors and to give as much um, scope as possible to the, uh, to the landscape. Um, I put there the date, we don't know the, we don't know the exact date, but I put about 1495, I think that's about the time of the Madonna of the Orange Tree. Um, and um, you have a rather a similar effect of movement. Notice the, the, uh, um, the way that the tree in the background sways, sways as if to um, um, to sympathize with, to echo the uh, movement of the, uh, uh, the virgin and, uh, and child. Um, the child is already moving, moving a bit here. He's a bit more athletic here too, too. He's just really moving a, 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 a bit more. I think it's worth pausing to ask, what, did the, what were all these um, you know, Madonnas uh, for? Uh, they, I think, were certainly not for, not for churches. Um, I, that's what that's what the altar pieces were for. Um, these were like kind of small scale versions of altar pieces, uh, but, um, but honing in on the most important uh, holy figures that you could uh, have in the home, probably uh, in the bedroom. But even so, we still don't know how they were uh, displayed. Um, it's possible, well, we don't know, um, that they were sort of treated like uh, icons, and this is. Um, Example of Greek icons are very, very popular in Venice. Another uh, export uh, from the Mediterranean into, uh, you know, into Venice. It's a Greek museum in, uh, in Venice for stuff for the icons. Um, icons uh, of um, Madonna and Child you tend to um, you know, help well. They were displayed in, uh, in churches, but they could also be you know, held in the hand and, and people would. Say their prayers directly to them, you know, kiss them even, and we have this very, very direct and, uh, and close uh, contact with the uh, with the image of um, uh, the Virgin uh, and Child. Um, and all the these Madonnas, I suppose, they might have been on little sort of house altars, a you know, pre dieu that you would kneel before you. Before you went to bed, you could say your prayers, perhaps in front of uh, you know, one of these uh, these Madonnas. But it could be also that they were really just um, part of the uh, background, and this is suggested and it's seen by um, Carpaccio, Saint Ursula, where this is uh, Saint Ursula's bedroom, and there you can see a Madonna and child just really quite high up on the wall there, and it's really like um, uh, the purpose is religious. But it's to, I think, mean, to give an idea of the constant uh, <coughs> presence of the uh, you know, of, uh, of Mary and Christ, just sort of watching over you in your uh, your everyday life, you know, uh, and uh, <coughs> protecting you, uh, and not necessarily the focus of um, intense prayer. But I don't think we have to come to any conclusion about this because I it probably had quite sort of flexible purposes. It would be, uh, and could be used in different ways by, uh, uh, by different people. Uh, now, the, the, function, the function was religious, but of course not just religious, they're also, uh, also aesthetic, and in fact the more, the more aesthetically sophisticated you were, the more, uh, more, the more beautiful you wanted your, uh, your Madonna uh, uh, to be. Uh, and this raises the question, uh, were these Madonnas uh, specifically commissioned by patrons, like all of these usually were. They were uh, you, um, uh, you, you had a chapel and a church and you wanted to commission an altar piece, and so you, you, know, you ordered it from the artist. Uh, but a Madonna, did you, did you say, well, um, did you go down to the Nini shop or Chima shop and say, oh, I'll, um, uh, I'll order a Madonna today? Or did you go into the shop and see a few Madonnas on the wall and go, oh, I'll have that one? This is the difference difference between you know off the peg or made to measure. Um, we don't we don't really know about this. But in the case of our picture, Madonna of the Linnet, uh, I think it's very great uh, refinement of the handling. 
um, does suggest to me that it was painted for uh, uh, a sophisticated uh, connoisseur. And it's a picture not known in, um, uh, in other versions. With this one example, uh, the painting that is now unfortunately uh, destroyed, it was destroyed at the end of the war in, 19, uh, in Berlin in, uh, in 1945. Um, um, but um, um, as far as we can tell from this old photograph, it's, it's rather less good. I especially, I especially don't like the face of the Madonna as much. Um, and, um, but it, anyway, it seems to be you know, a spin-off, a, 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 a replica. And also, notice, but notice that the landscape is, uh, uh, is different. So he's not ever exactly repeating himself between you know, one, you know, one Madonna uh, uh, and another. But um, in other cases, Shima made a large number of repetitions of, uh, and of quite differing quality. Um, here are just two. Uh, here, not far away from here. Wouldn't it be nice if they lent it? Anyway, um, you see how um, very similar, similar uh, it is to the uh, to the LA County one I just uh, showed you. But the background, is, the composition is the same. Uh, the background a bit uh, a bit different, um, uh, but both equally good. This is also a, this is also a very uh, a very beautiful picture. But that's not to say that all variants were of equally uh, good quality. And uh, look, there are masses of them. Uh, and these aren't, these aren't the ones I've just shown either. They're different. And, um, and so you can see that with a, there's a great market for these, uh, for these things in there. And some of them uh, really get quite uh, poor. I think this one is really not, not a very good one. And um, I, gosh, I can't remember now which one's which. But uh, one of the poorest is very, very one of the most distinguished museums. <laughs> um, um, now these figure groups seem to be of exactly the same size, so I think you must imagine the you must imagine the artist making uh, making a drawing, probably making a probably a stencil, uh, or anyway finding some way of a you know, mechanic getting his workshop assistant to um, transfer in a mechanical way uh, the group uh, from one from one panel to uh, uh, to another. And that would apply not just to the figure group, uh, but also to the landscape motifs. Now, you'll notice here that none of the landscapes are the same. They're all, you know, they're all different from, uh, from each other. But then you could, you could keep your landscape motifs and use them for uh, different compositions. For example, here, with one of the Milan's I'm going to show you, this is appears exactly the same as that. So that you could you could do your you could do your you know, your landscape drawing and just just insert that and do yeah, another composition that uh, that you uh, that you wanted. Or to make another example uh, the view of Conegliano I pointed out in connection uh, with uh, with St. Helena there appears in the background of this one I think it's in uh, I think it's in, uh, in Treviso, and even with the, you know, with the city uh, below on the uh, on the other side. This uh, topographically accurate view of uh, Conegliano. Of course, this isn't really drawn every time. You mustn't imagine Chima sitting out, you know, like uh, like you know, Monet outside uh, Rouen Cathedral, uh, you know, uh, doing a different uh, a different one every time. No, he does He does a drawing. He, he might take a sketch. Uh, outside, then you take it over to the workshop, and just uh, the motif just gets um, you know, repeated as uh, you know, as necessary. Um, now, next and nearly finally, I just I I have to raise the uh, the question that uh, was broached this morning, including in the uh, discussion session, um, about uh, how much uh, about the extent of the symbolism. Um, in, uh, 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 in such representations. And I've uh, gone on quite a lot about how similar these are to you know, actual uh, you know, hill towns in, uh, in, uh, in Bellini's area, um, home area. But are they also symbolic of, of something else? Um, is this perhaps, is this um, citadel meant to represent perhaps uh, Mount Zion, which is the 
go of earthly, uh, earthly uh, you know, uh, pilgrimage. The, the, tru the trouble about wanting to um, make these such details um, you know, symbolic is that it, sometimes he'd have it, sometimes he'd, uh, he'd drop it. No, no, we need to have well, anyway, it doesn't matter. He, he could he could drop them, but he could have a he could have a walled city, or he frequently didn't have a walled city. And um, now, in the, and the, sort of mi the mixture of um, of symbolism and possible non-symbolism uh, is uh, can be seen in our picture here. I mean, almost certainly the, the little bird, the linnet, is symbolic. And this is um, usually uh, usually the Christ child holds a goldfinch. And a goat, because a goldfinch does have a, uh, you know, a red patch that could be sort of symbolised as the uh, that could stand for the uh, blood, uh, blood um, shed by Christ. Um, uh, any ornithologists uh, 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 present could say whether linnets always do have um, uh, red patches on their uh, breasts. I think, I think probably not. Anyway, maybe slightly pinky, um, but. It probably, it probably um, is, it probably is uh, you know, symbolic. But the, the problem then is, um, is, is how far you take that. Um, as I said earlier on, she's uh, sitting on a marble seat. Um, is this a sarcophagus, perhaps, alluding to the death of Christ? It's not really sarcophagus shaped. Um, sometimes you have you know, similar, uh, similar uh, stone chests in representations of you know Pietà and things like that, and so you're you're inclined to think that in that case it is uh, it is uh, refers to the death of Christ. But you know, he's such a cheery little chap; he doesn't doesn't really look as if he's uh, he's thinking much about uh, death. Yeah. Um, but below, this is this is also something that came up in uh, questions. Um, uh, this morning, uh, it's a stag here, and I've got the quotation now. Yes, you were exactly right, whoever it was. As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for thee, O oh God. Is this the human soul, um, you know, longing for his uh, his creator, or is it um, a deer munching grass in a field? Um, <laughs> I think if you were out in if you were out in, uh, in the landscape here, you might well have. Uh, have seen it. Um, the, um, there's a ruined, ruined temple. Is this the, is this the um, basilica of Maxentius that famously uh, crumbled uh, of the uh, night of uh, nativity? Is this, is this alluding to the, um, uh, the decay of paganism with the coming uh, of, uh, of Christ? Um, uh, ruinous temples are, uh, are quite picturesque. Uh, the Soldier is the soldier um, you know, symbolical. Uh, why? Why the bridge of Pi why the bridge of Tiberias uh, in, the, in the background? Um, the, tr the trouble is, I'm, I'm not so I've admitted this probably is symbolical. Maybe, maybe this. After all, it's in the, book, uh, it's, it's in the foreground. But then, you know, how far can you? Uh, how far you can take this? Now, such questions uh, are often asked with. Um, with uh, reference to what the uh, really uh, greatest masterpiece of uh, Venetian uh, landscape painting, not not just in the USA but anywhere, and uh, and uh, for uh, for uh, an answer to these questions or a discussion of them, uh, see Susanna's book. Uh, and uh, but I'd just like to point out that this is this is full of. Um, full of details, uh, the donkey, heron, plants, the walled city, a, uh, a hilltop citadel, uh, you know, also, is this, uh, some art historians like to read this picture like a sort of, you know, iconographic lexicon, uh, that every single little detail there is symbolic and is perfectly true that if you, if you, if you start reading the, uh, the Christian fathers, or better still, the index, because then it's much quicker. You look up the index and uh, look up a donkey or something. You'll find masses about donkeys and uh, and how uh, you know, how they relate to the, of course, the story of Christ, also to the story of uh, uh, Francis and uh, and, uh, and so on. 
Um, so is, is every, if the, every single little detail um, you know, symbolical, or um, is it just a joy in God's creation? After all, this is what, you know, what Francis was about, it's sort of preaching to the birds and, uh, and, uh, and so on. I, I personally tend to go um, a bit softly on erudite iconography, um, but in particular with Chima. And so what, you know, what is true of Bellini isn't necessarily true of uh, Chima, I, because I think that um, with um, uh, Chima, it's just a, pretty, uh, just a very uh, natural enjoyment of the picturesque. Um, and I, I really do think that landscape in Chima is, in a way, you know, more um, mood music than, uh, than a theological text. <laughs> um, similar questions relate to the uh, fourth picture in the exhibition, uh, on which I will not linger at all long, a uh, follower of Giorgione, um, wherever it's painted by a younger painter than uh, Chima, and the subject is certainly secular, uh, not religious. The, uh, this is something that um, Susanna didn't particularly go into this morning. Um, the landscape is, I think, now strongly Northern European, but not, not Flemish anymore, much more um, German through uh, Prince. Um, the, uh, this kind of um, uh, uh, rock uh, and, and this sort of shaggy, shaggy foliage and uh, trees jutting out, and this sense of a, also a much larger and greater and sort of teeming nature is um, quite a, is, uh, is, uh, uh, is comes from Jura. And it's a wilder kind of landscape. It's not sort of domesticated in the way that the landscapes of both uh, Chima and Bellini uh, are. And this is, of course, the kind of landscape that you also find in uh, in Giorgio and his Fenris, uh, his, uh, his masterpiece. About 1505, the same date as the, uh, as the Chima. And, um, uh, uh, sorry, I made the landscape move. Um, and uh, see a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, uh, of the same elements uh, there. So, uh, close and contemporary, but um, a world away in, uh, in mood and, uh, in, uh, and composition. So, we go from the Chima with this kind of crisp clarity and carefully modeled forms, uh, meticulous detail, the, the luminous reflections we saw in the, in the river there, to this um, lush, uh, sultry, vaguely threatening um, kind of landscape, quite uh, dynamic, uh, unmeasurable, uh, and with um, very perplexing uh, content, uh, subject matter, that um, I certainly would give to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, praying to um, you know, an image of 
that they have been married achieves a certain purpose for it. It's not off-putting. Uh, right, it just seems like it may be the most important thing in the painting of the face. But I don't, maybe not, but, maybe not for this. Well, no, I think you're right. Yeah, I think you know, the face of the, the face of the Virgin is a very important thing. I think she's very beautiful. Yes. Thank you. Very young. Oh, yes. 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 Okay. So I have a question. Uh, first, I only have a minor in, in art history, uh, and I was taught that there's this big emphasis in uh, Venetian school on atmosphere and weather. And I wonder is that if you could speak a little bit about that. And also, you were talking about the, um, the icons. My understanding is that they're venerated, and it's, they're viewed as like windows to heaven. And I wonder, with all of the um, Byzantine influence on Venice, if is this a Venetian way of expressing the heavens in having so much emphasis on Venice, or is it because it's a seaside place? Well, so, um, well, first of all, with, um, with atmosphere, the word, the, um, word at, the word atmosphere in English actually has uh, two, two meanings right. which really aren't the same because you, you, know, you, you come into a room and you feel there's an atmosphere right. and, you mean, and you mean a mood, but, all, but very importantly it also means you know, air yes. and, uh, and Venetian painters are interested in both, um, so they're interested in the softening the softening effects of of air, and it may, I mean, that we, 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 we should we should have our, our Madonna up on the on the screen and um, to try and decide about that, um, because um, um, I probably probably you if if uh, in reality in reality today um, this is probably all a bit too sharp. Uh, for um, and this is of course not taking an account of uh, you know, atmospheric pollution because you can't see you can't actually see the distances nowadays as you, uh, as well as you probably could in his day. But but having said that, he's also probably painting them more sharply, you know, just for the sake of legibility uh, than it would have been in his day. But the the. What is called by art historians the aerial perspective, the uh, effect of air on distances, which is something you know, pioneered by Flemish painters, is pursued by, uh, by the, uh, no, the, the Venetians. And um, uh, just as I said, with, just as I said that you know, Chima had rather sort of hard, uh, hard flesh, I think the, the, the forms are a little bit sort of too, too sharp. Um, not quite corresponding to the practical experience, um, and especially in the next generation with Giorgione and then with Titian, they paint the backgrounds much, much, much more freely. Um, so, but I think I think what we have here is the you know, beginnings of that. But I think he'd rather plot space more through um, you know, recession like this, in, right. like sort of stage flats, rather. But there's nothing to do with the weather of this focus on, is there any Well, I think you do. So no. you see the dark clouds. Yeah. Yeah, but you have, no, but as I suggest, you have times of day, uh, but you no, know, you never have bad weather in Chile. No. no. <laughs> that, well, I mean, that is the, that is, um, that is the novelty of your journey. To the Tempest is yes. showing stories, right. extraordinary novelty. And then after that, in, uh, in Venetian painting, yes, suggestion of, well, not just of that, but anyway, of a, of a wind blowing through. No, no, nothing as, nothing as dramatic as that. And then, but then the mood, well, I mean, I think the atmosphere, uh, sorry, sorry, the um, landscape um, is, is, is part of the mood of the painting. I think it's a very, uh, I think it's a very um, uh, poetic, uh, compliment uh, no, uh, to the foreground, and, uh, and that adds to the religious content and very much the aesthetic content. Okay, let's go back there. Yes, um, in regard to the uh, Madonna's face, um, this young lady seems to be painted from a person, from a model, versus the more stylized versions of earlier Madonnas. So in reflection of the economics of the time, they had to sell their paintings to support their livelihood. How
how much variation of the Madonna was based on a wealthy uh, merchant's wife or daughter or mistress uh, versus a stylized version. Mm. Well, I, I think um, very very little is uh, you know is known about the use of live models at this um, uh, at this time, um, and I I get this just boils down to a matter of a, you know a matter of opinion because I'm not myself um, I don't really see that as uh, I do see that as rather idealized and not necessarily as a representation of a you know, of a particular woman I mean they they, they it's, um, um, perhaps this perhaps this should be discussed more in connection with men because because you know, male male heads do tend to be you know, more differentiated whereas you know a young woman is is usually going to be so idealized that they all you know, begin to look rather like each other but a um, with, if you, you know if, the, if uh, Christ is surrounded by the apostles for example they, they you know the, the different you know, men's heads will be um, you know, uh, will be varied. But um, there are some uh, some sort of drawings uh, in this period you know, from uh, from <coughs> life, and that's to say that's to say not meant to be of particular people, but drawings of life to, uh, from life, so that they can uh, make their religious figures look um, you know, look look more realistic. But I don't I don't really think that in uh, in in this case, but. Again, you know, I don't, uh, I don't know. There's not, um, um, uh, there's not really the you know, evidence, you know, one way or the other to know, you know, when Bellini painted a Madonna, did he, you know, did he, did he have a, you know, a female model, uh, you know, uh, sitting there, and he, did he have the same one for the next Madonna he was doing, or did he just get it all out of his head? I really don't know. In fact, you know, the artist present could really uh, uh, answer that question better than I could. What I was finding interesting is, mm -hmm. since we're focused, kind of talking about the Madonna's face, is not the face, but the differentiation in the direction of her gaze in many of the Madonnas, her gaze and the Christ child's gaze. And I think that there's some poetic but <coughs> reasons, like she's looking downcast into the side and the child looks <coughs> off in the distance. And also the way that um, Bellini, Chima, and through the other Renaissance artists, all of a sudden now on the altarpieces, the Madonna is looking straight at the viewer and engaging with the viewer. And I find that that um, I, I like the way those changes occur through the years and this the way the Madonna is seated. Here she's seated and her knees are parallel, but in the the other uh, paintings that you showed us. All of a sudden, her knee, one knee is raised like the Pieta. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that uh, it was a reference for me to Michelangelo's Pieta. And I just uh, well, I think, appreciate well, those differences. Yes, I think there would be a lot of differences. I, I mean, basically, this is a very, I mean, this is, this is really quite a boring subject in a way. It's just, you know, a half, you know, a half, one half length figure with a, you know, with an infant. And it's really quite extraordinary how much you know, variety that they, they uh, you know, they can do with that. You know, the, but even the you know, Madonna and uh, Madonna and child on the throne of the saints. I mean, it could be, uh, it, it could be, it could be such a boring composition. And every time a painter does it, he thinks, well, how can I make this just a little bit different? You know, well, how can I make the saints, you know, act, you know look in different directions or um, perhaps engage with each other or perhaps not engage with each other in different surroundings and so on. So I think each, um, um, they, they, although it'd be wrong to say that they're not repetitive because you've seen some up there which are very repetitive, um, but um, but that's just because there's so much you know, demand for it. And when, they're, when the artists are really trying, you can, I mean, you're right, there's a huge variety you can build into it where the child looks, where the, where the mother looks, whether they look outwards, whether they look towards you. And this is, um, uh, this is actually something, this is something I didn't, this is the point I didn't make. But I think with the Levi's Madonna's, they never look at you. Uh, and uh, they look at something else, um, and they, but they're really more internalized also. So they're not, 
not necessarily looking at the child either, but they're certainly thinking about the child. And I think on, on the whole, you know, Bellini is, this is probably a horrible um, uh, simplification, but Bellini is a little, a little bit more thoughtful and internalized and uh, Chima's just a bit more extrovert, as she certainly she is. Thank you. Uh, Professor Humphrey, thank you very much. I brought some students up, and it so happened that we were reading your chapter before we came, and we got onto a discussion about, you called the Madonna's rustic looking, and I was trying to give a definition to it. Could you? Give us your definition. Uh, maybe it was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think she is not rustic at all, and I didn't go. I didn't go in that uh, that direction. I think I. I think it means that they little. I think it's in contrast to Bellini, where they really are much more. They're, they they are more elevated and uh, and more spiritual and. These could be now. What I'm to well, I say, I'm contradicting my, myself like mad because I I suggested just now to this gentleman that that it, you know, it wasn't a real woman, that a uh, real ordinary woman that he was uh, that he was representing, um, and that is in, that that is you know what's implied uh, implied by that. Um, I I suppose I was also thinking of that he has. These you know, roots in the country, and that he's very fond, you know, he's very fond of it, and that some of them you can see as sort of natural inhabitants, of, in a way, of this world. But you know, they also have to you know, be the Virgin Mary. They're not just any sort of country girl. So perhaps I use that. Well, term, she's more earthy, term, maybe, you know, than a Bellini. Maybe a little, yes. yes. But maybe I use the term in a Thank you. Could you say something about the curvature of the panel that she's painted on? Was that original, or is that oh, no. a function of age? Oh no, that's a function of age. That it's um, uh, bowed. Yes, yes. Um, but um, when uh, no, well, uh, no, uh, 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 well, of course that's going to happen. Or it, it's liable to happen with the. I should, I should have mentioned at the beginning. This is painted on uh, you know, on poplar panel, which is you know quite elastic. Um, but in the in the past, um, uh, conservators have tried to prevent that happening by putting on the back what's called a cradle uh, to kind of you know, make it rigid. But that is a disaster. You should let it bow like that because if it happens um, slowly over a period of time, it won't. Um, uh, it, the uh, uh, you know, the paint the paint will survive it, and the the, the um, how many how many boards are there? Yeah. Two. Um, I think it's two. Two, two. So you don't want it. Um, so uh, you don't want the split to open. But so sometimes, but sometimes they do. Um, but um, the cradle is a disaster because it holds it you know, too rigidly, and cracks start opening up down the um, uh, you know, down the grain, uh, not even the you know, not even the joints, and uh, so uh, most. Most cradled uh, panels nowadays have had, you know, had, had the cradles removed. Well, that's the one. Not always, but it just depends you know, how they're responding to it. Yes, it's you know, humidity. I always wondered um, with Venetian artists, it always appears that the child appears to have a, a man like quality in the facial expressions and body language, but it seems as though Chima achieved more of an infant-like likeness, and I was wondering if you would agree with that? Yes, yes, I think, well, I, I think I sort of half implied that by, you know, saying he's, uh, uh, he, 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 yes, he is more childlike, because again, it was a contrast with Bellini, Bellini's babies are so solemn, and they're also introspective, and you know, they're seeing, they're seeing, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're seeing the future also, and uh, there, there's a strong element of pathos very often in the uh, in, uh, in the Madonna sort of Bellini. But no, this is uh, this is um, this is sort of baby you like to have on the whole. And it's, and it's, <laughs> and it's, and it's, I suppose you know, by a real human baby, his head's a bit small, isn't it? 
uh, we will discuss all this, but you know, this is, this is Jesus, he can do, it's not an ordinary thing. <laughs> So in Professor Campbell's high uh, renaissance art history class, we've been talking about how Shima maybe has a bit of an unfair reputation as derivative. Um, and so I wanted to ask... An unfair reputation of what? As being derivative, yes. as kind of a secondary yes. artist. Yes. And I wanted to ask you, um, what makes Shima worth a life of scholarship and study? Well, I, I, I did actually try to say in what, in what ways he was different from from Bellini, uh, the, you know, with the you know, um, particularly um, you know, movement and the um, uh, and, uh, and the greater uh, and, the, uh, and the greater quantity of landscape, um, but um, but I think that the I think that um, in you know when you're writing um, a history of art, you're going to concentrate on the people that are. Um, are very, very radically innovative, and not, and not the artists that are just beautiful. <laughs> and uh, I think Masaccio is an incredibly ugly, ugly yeah. painter, but you know he is important, undoubtedly, undoubtedly very. He's well, he's powerfully expressive, but also, I mean, you know, the you know, revolution he's bringing out in, uh, in Florentine painting earlier in the uh, in the century. Um, um, but I wasn't. I wasn't. Um, uh, I, uh, I was trying to make clear at the beginning that uh, Chima was uh, an heir to a lot of these innovations that had already taken place, and that he wasn't himself you know, a great inventor. And he just. But he just. Um, um, he just makes very beautiful pictures. But if you're if if you're you know writing a history of art and you have to. Uh, and you have to, uh, you get, you know, your publisher is is giving you a limited number, uh, number of illustrations, and with each artist a limited, you know, a limited number. You've got to, you've really got to find the artists who, who move because you're telling the story also. So you want the artists who really are moving, moving things forward, and uh, and so according to uh, that narrative, you're going to go from. Um, you know, from uh, Berlin to Giorgione to, uh, to Tisha. And uh, you're probably going to also, uh, this doesn't apply to Chima, but you're probably going to leave out the lesser uh, you know, centers. Um, and what the great problem then for the writers of the, uh, the history of art is what you do with an artist who's a major, a major artist in a small center, you know, like somebody like, like uh, Correggio in the early 16th century. Um, so you have to have him in because he's so extraordinarily good, but uh, he doesn't really he doesn't really fit comfortably into the into the narrative. So um, I think that's the it's it's rather a, it's rather a, 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 a banal reason, but you, you, there isn't in a survey there is not there is not room for everybody, uh, but that doesn't take away from the fact that some some uh, some artists who aren't great innovators. Um, nevertheless, get kind of, you know, left out. And as we've you seen can it, still be very beautiful. As you've seen in several paintings you showed us today, she no longer And it did Yes, but, but, but not as radically as, right. you know, if you are taking a broad brush you know, approach. So would you say it's principally a matter of style for the writers of the histories of art that they go from? Oh no, I no, it isn't that because you have plenty of non have plenty of you know, non painting artists. Um, no, I just, I just think that uh, other uh, other artists are, you know, are more radical. No, he's I mean, he's he is a little. A little bit sort of stuck in a, a groove. Oh, it's a lovely groove. He's, <laughs> uh, he's, he's, he's not, not really opening up you know, a new world. Well, why don't we continue talking?
conversation in our reception next door, and thank you again for coming.